Here we go. Hello! All right. This is going to be a messy one today. We'll get to that in a second. First off, hey, Darius and Jace, Barrett, good to see you. Sergeant Queef, Shimera. And that's a lot for right now, unless, uh, well, unless um, Twitch is lying to me this time. Hello, already 30 seconds behind schedule. I know, actually, yeah, I was, uh, I was reading through this stuff again, because what I did was, I was watching Shimera stream the other day, and he was doing the uh, geometry clip map stuff, so to, for basically for doing very large terrains. And I thought, that looks complicated, but uh, cool. And, but, and then I thought, oh, I'll be able to, maybe I can do a much simpler thing with tessellation, because I remembered this little quality of tessellation where, let me just scroll down here, I'll, I'll bring up a picture. Um, so the whole feature is that you can take an object and subdivide it a number of times. And what's really nice is you can control how many times it's subdivided on each side. So I was thinking, all right, I'll do a grid. So, um, let's... Where's my doodling device? I am so organized today. It's around here somewhere. There it is. Let's get back to... Umax and Gromit MPX. And let's get that out of the way. So what I thought was... I would have... In a similar technique to how Shimera is doing it, saying how... The map that you're standing on, or the part of the terrain you're standing on, be very highly tessellated, or very high resolution. And then the next tile across, I would set this edge to match, and then set lower tessellations for the other side. And then just let it work out all the triangles and stuff for the various bits, whatever. And then this will be lower again, or some other low resolution. I thought, oh yeah, that that would be really cool. Um, but what I didn't think of was the fact that this tessellation stuff here is actually per triangle. So this would only work if I had exactly one quad like this. Oh, it doesn't want to draw now. Yep. I had one quad here and tessellated that, and then one quad here and tessellated that. And I don't think that's the most efficient way. What, what I originally I wanted in my head was you would have grids of like 16 by 16, and that would be your minimum resolution, and then you'd subdivide that to higher. So if I mean, like I think, I'd like say tessellating 32 or 64 times is kind of reasonable. So then I was like, oh, that would be, that would be all right, because that would take it up to thousands of tiles. But now I'm not entirely sure what to do. So I was sitting here just before the stream. I was like, oh, I'll go through this now. Just have a quick idea of what's going on. And realize that the approach I wanted to do will not work. And I would have to uh, do in the same way Shimera's technique has patches. I would have to have a strip that goes between these two. Um, where this side had the lower resolution. And this side had the higher resolution. And let the patch fill everything in. Yeah, that's that's what I would need. And so that was a bit of a bummer. <laughs> so I, I'm not entirely sure what to do on this stream other than start looking at tessellation. Um, because I realized when I was reviewing this stuff again that when I implemented the tessellation stuff in the compiler, I was just absolutely swamped in material. And I managed to get just enough of it in my head to be able to implement the compilation stages, and then I have forgotten everything. So if it works with you guys, what I'd like to do is just start going through uh, the documentation. And I've got an example, a Lispified example of um, the tutorial, not here, but from Little Grasshopper. He's got a wonderful uh, tessellation tutorial. I thought we'd have a peek at this, have a peek at my implementation, and just try and work some stuff out if that works with but if it works with you guys that's what i'm doing so feel free to stick around or not i'm a, i'm sorry it's not going to be the terrain episode that i wanted it to do but um we'll see we'll see so shimera saying some stuff anyway for what it's worth uh tessellation shaders are actually employ an, an employed uh strategy for terrain streaming i just didn't want to do it because it requires gl4 and clip map approach seem to be more interesting yeah it's cool uh, you don't need to match the vertices. Why not? You can just use linear interpolation between the current and next level. Yeah, but then you've got mismatched, mismatched uh, vertices at different points, which could lead to holes. 
I think if we get the tessellation levels the same, the implementation is meant to guarantee those things would line up. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, one side could interpolate between the other one. Maybe. Maybe. I guess the... One second, I'm not passing you correctly here. Like if the one, one the current level is between two vertices on the next level, you can interpolate its position along the two. Yeah. Hmm. Could do. Let me doodle that down. So, go on. What's going on here? Oh, I know what. No, one second. I'm on the wrong machine again. Okay. Um, so we're saying that we could have a higher resolution thing here. So that's the thing is we'd have to have the... Oh, where are we? We've got the lower resolution one here. And we've got the higher resolution guy here. Um... So we'd have to interpolate to make sure these lined up with those ones. Ah, uh, yeah. Could do that. What I was kind of hoping for is if I could make these two sides line up um, tessellation-wise, and then I should be able to do... Because basically I want to have um, a height map for the low-resolution stuff and then some Perlin noise stuff put on top of that for detail. And then I have to... In oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, it should be okay, but I don't know, man. I'm going to struggle enough with this as it is. Hey, Barrett. How the vertice, how the edge is drawn is literally a linear interpolation between the vertices. If you do the same for the vertex on the current level, you get no gap. Yeah, okay. I'm still not... I, I don't think that's what I'm going to do. Well, it's not what I'm going to do today. It's not what I'm going to do today. But it's good to know. Thank you. I will, um, I'll have to look at that and fumble around with that off stream, I think. So what I'm going to do is just start going through the documentation. So this is back to one of the older me learn stuff type streams. So, just so we have something to stare at, I do have an example. Whoa that we can use. So if we go to Keppel examples, rather than our new usual repo, probably won't be pushing any new code today. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, examples, where are we? Plus camera. Let's compile this guy. And run loop. And what's going on? Oh yeah, I'm in the wrong package. Am I? Shouldn't be. What's going on here? Do that. Well, this is a good start. Okay, host step nil. The function callless nils. Oh, moron. Need to start a session here. Oh, good lord. What is going on? Yep, it's going to be this kind of stream. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so. Startup capital. Compile all this stuff. Get in the right package. Run the example, hopefully. Right, cool. And this isn't drawing in a decent viewport, so let's do that quickly. Defvar VP is a viewport. And let's set the viewport resolution of VP to be the surface resolution of whatever the current surface is in the Keppel context. And then we'll use with viewport down here where we're rendering. And hopefully, 
and it will fill our little region. I mean, it's stretching it, but at least it's filling it now. That'll do. Cool. And we've got a bunch of code. So we have a pipeline down here, which is taking... Um, we're going to be doing tessellations. We're talking about patches. These patches have three vertices, so they're triangles. We're pumping them through a vertex uh, stage as usual, and then they're going into a tessellation control stage. We're going to read up on what exactly that does. From there, it passes through one more fixed function stage, and then comes into tessellation evaluation. Um, and then we get going through geometry, which is calculating some things to allow us to do the um, wireframe kind of thing we've got going on here. And then fragment, which is coloring fragments as usual. So, what we can see up here, there's a few things. The uh, tessellation um, control stage, this one, declares right at the top what kind of patch is leaving it. So we'll have to look that up to see what, um, to see what that was for. And then it's setting the inner and outer tessellation levels. So this is very easy for us to mess with. So let's just set them to one to begin with. And we see this is the sphere we're actually drawing. And then if we tessellate the outside, you'll see each triangle now has three um, parts to it. So it's been split into three, but the center hasn't been split. Let's stop this rotation because it's actually a little hard to see what's going on or at least slow it down a lot. Okay. So yeah, here each one is split in three and then the center is just one point. Now, if we then go and mess with that, where was it? Here we go, tessellation level inner, we set that up to two, nothing happens to three. We can see now it's created an inner triangle um, but hasn't affected the number of uh, points on the outside. So we could set this down to one and see each triangle is not subdivided along the outside edge, but is subdivided here. And then we can we can set this up. We can do three on the inside, five on the outside, and all this kind of stuff. So we're adding loads of geometry. Um, oh, Shamara's just saying, yeah, not that it'll be easy, that it works. No, that's great. Um, I'll trust, I, I mean, I trust you. It's just, just not today, um, but it is cool. That is, that is actually real, uh, it's a relief to know. I mean, it should be, I just I have to make the inside one match the outside one. And I'd kind of like the other way. I'd like to have the inside one just be as like highly tessellated as possible and have each outside one take that level and, and work out and blur me as well. That's always nice to have. So that's our tessellation control. And then down in tessellation evaluation, something else is happening. It says that it's tessellating two triangles, which suggests that it might not be triangles coming into here to begin with. Um, it's saying spacing is equal, which you'll look into, and there's some uh, order stuff, so to do with counterclockwise, which we've seen before for using front faces and things like that, front face, back face. But that's, well, I don't know what it's going to be used for this time, I've forgotten. And now what I do remember is that the uh, tessellation coordinates are the position inside the patch that we're in. So our patch is a triangle and this is the X, Y, and Z um, position inside that patch for this. So I think this is gonna get run once for each vertex and then our vertex is going to um, have a position inside that patch. Actually, that makes sense because if we tessellate this, let's just do that for a second. Let's set these both to three, bam. This one, th this one controls how the tessellation is done, as we've seen with fiddling with these numbers here. Things are going to get tessellated. And then we've got this evaluation stage where we're able to, this kind of is like a vertex stage for each tessellated part. Um, but we actually get the context of the entire patch, which is interesting. Um, this is a... Um, vector 3 telling us the position of our vertex inside the original patch, so in, inside our original triangle. And then we can multiply that with the original um, 
yeah, with the original positions from the patch to calculate the actual, ah, the actual vertex position. Wow, that's kind of crazy. But what it means is like, if I, if I fuck with this, how should we deal with this? Let's get rid of this normalized first. This is, whoa, okay. That was pushing out to be a unit sphere. I don't really care about that. Um, it's also gonna mean it's not an ideal sphere when we zoom in, but let's, uh, let us get this up. Oh, it's gonna be good when I actually know what's going on. We have a camera variable, which is named poorly, but it'll do. I mean, it's got its earmuffs on. Um, position. Oh, okay. Fair enough, wasn't very far away. 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. Cool. So, see if we can get a bit closer, yeah. The reason for that normalization before was we were tessellating a sphere. Now notice how when it's tessellated, it's created new triangles, but they're all on the same plane as before, which is perfect. I mean, that's ideal for us, but bad if you want this to be a lovely sphere. I mean, you added all this extra geometry and it didn't get smoother. But for us, this is, this is great. So we don't want any extra magic. We just compute the final position of our um, vertex and then we transform it by the um, modeled clip matrix. That's interesting. I wouldn't have thought that was necessary down here, but sure, fine, we can deal with that. Um, and then, yeah, then we pass some values onto geometry. We'll see what all this is for later. This is all part of an example I didn't write, so yeah. Let's just dive into tessellation and see what we've got here. So, coffee armed and people to stare at. Barrett is having issues with his sound again. Messi Jan, hey there. Um, yeah, chat's working. This is going to be a me rambling kind of stream. Good to see you. Um, let's let's get into this. Okay, so tessellation is one of the uh, vertex processing stages. So when our data comes in, it goes through the vertex stage, and then it can go through optionally. Uh, the tessellation stages, which are the tessellation control, tessellation evaluation, and then the last stage is geometry. And then after that, all kinds of stuff is going to happen in the fixed function part of the GL pipeline, and then we're going to get fragment shaders. Um, so yeah, here it's divided up into three stages, uh, two of which are programmable, and one of them is fixed function. So we have control, and then let's have a look, here we go. Um, Yes, generally the process involves subdividing a patch, which we set up in the control thing, computing new vertex uh, values, which was in the tessellation evaluation stuff. Oh, cool. So each stage performs part of this process. The control stage determines how much tessellation to do. It can also adjust the actual patch data as well as feed additional patch data to later stages. Therefore, the TCS is primarily responsible for ensuring continu uh, continuity across patches. Cool. So if you have two adjacent patches that need different levels of tessellation, the TCS invocations for the different patches need to use the tessellation controls to ensure that the shared edges between the patches are using the same level of tessellation. That is cool. Huh. This could work then. If we were... Because we have... We have some information. One second. So the idea, the idea is in here we get to pick what the tessellation um, levels are. Now you see that I only do this when the GL invocation ID is zero. Um, let's actually look that up because I don't remember well enough how to explain that. Oh. oh, of course, it's not going to be in that syntax. GL invocation. 
the index of the um, tessellation controls shader invocation within this patch. Writes to per vertex output variables by using this to index them. Let's see if we can get a friendlier description of that anywhere. Ah, the documentation for tessellation control. That makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, fuck, fair enough. Right. So it's gonna be one of those streams. Um, okay. In the tessellation control language, GL invocation ID contains the number of the output patch vertex assigned to the shader invocation. You assigned an integer value in the range where n is the number of output patch vertices. Okay. So where are we using that? So yeah, it'll be between zero and two. Um, Oh no, see we're using this to index into here. So it's got to be safe for that. Oh yeah, so that sounds reasonable. Hmm. Now, because I was thinking that you, this um, only setting these values for the first vertex in the triangle was to do with oh what do they call it they have like a primary vertex and um it, it, it this matters when you do flat shading across triangles and you set the color of one of them basically what values are going to be kept what's going to be interpolated things like this um yeah okay it's not the most satisfying but where's our um Tessellation control shader stuff, yeah. So, GL invocation ID. Okay, all the inputs from the vertex um, shaders to the tessellation control stage, tessellation control shader, I've got to get in the habit of saying that right, um, are aggregated into arrays based on the size of the input patch size. The size of these arrays is the number of index, uh, of number of input patch parameters provided to the by the patch primitive. Hwa. Okay. Um, every TCS invocation for an input patch has access to the same input data, save for the GL invocation ID, which will be different for each invocation. Cool. So yes. So this is going to get evaluated once for each of the vertices in the inbound patch. Our inbound patch is a triangle, so we're going to get three of them. This is good because it allows us to index into there and get some of this data out. Um, groovy. Can't remember why we only need to set this here, but I think that'll become apparent later. Um, let's get rid of this guy and bring this guy to the front. Okay. So that was the tessellation control sh uh, shader. And then everything goes through the tessellation primitive generator, which takes the input patch and subdivide it based on the values computed by the tessellation control shader or provided as default. We do everything in the shader. I'm not sure if I actually have added control for that via Keppel to do it outside the outside the stage. I might have. I'll have to go look at the I'll have to go look at the documentation. Um, But what seemed interesting here, sorry, I got, got away from myself here, is if in this stage, I know what the vertex ID is. And in this stage, I can control these tessellation levels. So if I pass that ID down, I should be able to tell when I'm on the edge of say my quad and change the tessellation levels there. It could actually work. That might not be a bad idea. Then we can just have the 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 outside edge of the um, of the quad be tessellated to a different level. 
Agas in future, I'd appreciate it if you could avoid streaming right after RLM releases a video. Who's RLM? What's RLM? I don't know your acronyms. Could I push what I have now to GitHub? I already have. This is on the Keppel Examples uh, repo. Which you can find on my GitHub. Oh, Red Letter Media. Nice. Oh, yeah. That is uh, that is a problem. I, I advise... Shin, to be honest, you might want to go to that, <laughs> that one rather than my one. Because this might be a recap for you. Uh, I'm just going to be doing a lot of reading today. But feel free to stick around. It's always good to have you. Um, yeah, I'm on the master branch as well, Melian. So it should be good. Let's have a look. Right, so... And obviously, I've I've changed some of these. Uh, I'm using declarations inside my GPU functions to tell the compiler certain things about uh, the tessellation stages, and I do the same for geometry as well. So this is going to be rather different from what we find in the documentation. So this will take some working out. But what we can do is if we go to here and go pull G. What's the pipeline called? Draw sphere. We pull back the whole pipeline and we can go see what it converted it into. Um, so here's our tessellation control stage. And the layout is... Okay, so it's just saying what the layout of the outbound stuff is. And that's pretty much it. Which I think makes sense if we go and... Oops. If we go back and look... At our tessellation control, outbound patch vertices three. Well, that makes sense. Um, that's what that turned into. And then in our tessellation evaluation stage down here, ah, here's our layout again. So here it says that the that the inbound layout is triangles. Um, equal spacing and counterclockwise. Okay, so it isn't that exotic a change. Um, I know that the compiler, or I, I, I think I remember that the compiler also takes this information and passes it down with the compilation. Um, so some things are going to propagate automatically for us and some things. Don't. Let's have a look. Tessellate 2. Ah, we'll see what that means in good time. Let's go. Okay, so after tessellation control, there's a tessellation primitive generator. That's a fixed function part, and that's the bit that actually does the division. Um, the exact way that these are split up, I think, is implementation defined. Um, but there are some specification um, required properties. Focus, you proverbial, the fuck. Um, ah, it can be blurry for a bit until it annoys me again. Um, okay, so that's the fixed function part of the pipeline, and then the tessellation evaluation shader takes the tessellated patch and computes the vertex values for each generated vertex. So that's where we actually get to position these new guys that we've made. Um, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Okay, patches, because this is a different primitive than we're normally using. We're normally doing triangles or lines or all that kind of stuff. And hey, Phil Fork, how you doing? And let's have a look. So yes, patches, slightly different. So Tesla, and, and th this is one other part of Keppel. Because I've done less stuff here and I don't have that many users, this is where we're, oh, what the fuck is going on there? That is Tesla really badly. Or rather, I've positioned it very badly after the tessellation. That's very interesting. We might swap things out. I'd actually like to swap this shape out for something else. And um, yeah. We'll see. Good to have you. Right, let's see. Okay, so tessellation stages operate on patches. A primitive type denoted by the constant patches. Fair enough. Yes, we will do that with a keyword. Patch primitive is a general purpose primitive where every um, n vertices is a new patch primitive. Cool, so rather than saying triangles, which is three, or lines, that's two, or line strip, or whatever, you say patch and a size. Um, you'll see this in Keppel around let's see i've got a declaration down here here's patch three um so again we do things slightly different but it'll all make sense eventually um also the pipeline will check the style of buffer stream you're giving it to make sure that it's receiving the right thing 
So normally this is kind of lenient. Um, now it's going to be fairly specific. So it's expecting a patch of three. Um, it's going to look at this buffer stream. And if we look down in the mini buffer here, we can see that when we construct a buffer stream, the default primitive type is triangles. Um, so triangles are equivalent to a patch of three. So it's fine. There's some different places you can place that uh, control. So that we'll, we'll get into that if we need to. Okay, so we don't have to worry about this function because Kepler will do it. But um, patch primitives alway, are always a sequence of individual patches. There's no such thing as a patch strip or a patch loop. Nice. So for a given vertex stream, every group of that many uh, vertices will be a separate patch, which is nice and simple to remember. Um, we're not going to worry about this. Cool. Okay, so then the, then the overview of the control sh uh, shader, and we're going to go and look at its article in a minute because there's going to be a lot to go through. So the first step of tessellation is the optional invocation of a tessellation control shader. Yep, determine the amount of tessellation and perform any special transformations. So this is vertexy shader kind of stuff, and this is yeah deciding how to split it up, which is what we saw before as well. Tessellation control sh shader can change the size of a patch, add more, can change the size of a patch. Okay. I mean, that's, you can reposition it, of course. I mean, you can set any of those values. Um, it's also optional. I think it's optional in Keppel. I'll have to check that at some point. Um, if no tessellation shader is active in the current program or in pipeline, then the patch data is applied directly to the vertex shader implications. Ah, yeah, anyway. It's not needed, necessarily. I wonder what the uh, what happens if we take it out. Oh yeah, that does exactly what you should think it should do. Doesn't do any tessellation. There we go. Oh, that's cool. Yay, Keppel kind of works sometimes. And now I've said it, I'm doomed. Right, so, um, and this is saying that, okay, so this is providing the default values for inner and outer tessellation level. So if you remove this stage, tessellation will happen. Um, I don't think I've got somewhere you can configure these, but we can add it. It's like, it's a half hour job and then another half an hour for some testing. Um, yeah, we could add uh, rotate by dragging, but right now that's not annoying me. But we'll we'll definitely do that if uh, if it becomes a problem. It's actually quite nice. So I could see those silly artifacts around the base. Um, okay, so tessellation primitive generation. Okay, this is a step we don't control. So this is like the stage between vertex and fragment shader, um, where like, wait a second, what I'm thinking of. Yes, when all your, um, what's it, uh, W, um, the W divide and all that kind of stuff, clip space, hoo-ha, and all that thing is, is done in there. So um, they're all in fixed function parts, and the part that actually splits all your triangles up into fragments um, is all fixed function. You never write code specifically for that, though you can tweak the values. Um, with things like viewport, for example, is a value that's passed into up to the GPU to let it know the size of the viewport which is important when it's making those fragments. So, this does some stuff. Um, it's affected by the following factors. Those levels that we just set, the spacing of the tessellated vertices. Ah, so that's as, as defined by the next stage. See, that's really ugly, isn't it? You have this stage, which comes before... Um, wait, have I got that in the right order? Yeah, we've got tessellation control, and then this, and then tessellation evaluation. Hmm. But it is affected by the spacing as defined by the subsequent tessellation evaluation stage. Let's go have a look at that. Tessellate 2. So yes, this is giving some values that affect the, um, the kind of intermittent stage. Yeah. Not on GL niceness there. 
Um, okay, anyway, the input primitive def type defined by the subsequent uh, tessellation evaluation stage with maybe um, triangles, quads, or iso lines. So that's, yeah, again, saying what it's going to tessellate to. So I think you can have quads tessellate down to triangles or whatever. Um, or, again, well, really, it's it's a patch. It's a patch of four being tessellated to a quad or a patch of four to ice lines, things like this. The primitive generation uh, order defined by the subsequent tessellation evaluation stage. Yes, yeah, so again, all this stuff and this stuff affects this middle bit. That's, that's what you would expect anyway, so that's not a big deal. Um, but there's this concept of an abstract patch, and I know this has confused me before, so I want to go through this. The, the primitive generation is not affected by the user-defined outputs of the tessellation control stage um, or vertex uh, shader if no tessellation, well, yeah, if the TCS isn't active. Um, the tessellation control shader's output patch size or any per patch um, TCS outputs. Oh, blimey, that's just a big old round sentence. Okay. Um, beside the tessellation levels. Primitive generation part of the tessellation stage is completely blind to the actual vertex coordinates and other patch data. Ooh, okay. The purpose of the primitive generation system is to determine how many vertices to generate and in what order to generate them and what kinds of primitive to build them out of, to build out of them. Um, the actual vertex data for these vertices, such as position, color, and etc., is going to be generated by the tessellation evaluation shader based on the information provided by the primitive generator. Okay, so this is providing all the information to the next one. Um, yeah, I think I follow that. Okay, so actually I, I, read, I did read that slightly wrong. It's these three values and these values. It's definitely not this. Um, it doesn't care about this. Which is interesting. Uh, whew. Because of this, the primitive generate operates on what could be considered an abstract patch. It doesn't look at the patch from the control stage. It only thinks of terms and tessellating an abstract quad triangle isoline. Okay, so it's not, yeah, it's not interested in the actual thing. Um, I suppose this is why in the tessellation evaluation stage we get these the tessellation chord coordinate rather is just uh, centered around some ideal patch but let me show you because this is uh, something I have, I have seen before if we take rather than doing these multiplies let's just set position to be GL test chord now it's not visible god damn it okay um Da, 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 da. Plus, let's offset it some. Oops. Okay, we can't do it that way. And let's set the camera to 0.2. Okay. So here we can see that everything is now this one triangle. Let's see what I can screw with here. Oh yeah, it's because we've still got this, um, this bit of code going on, so let's do... Right, so this is what is actually produced. So for all of the different invocations, we get the same primitive essentially. Oh, it's really hard to explain what's going on because mainly because I don't quite get it. So the intermediate stage is going to calculate, is going to look at this and this and calculate one of these with the right subdivision levels. And then you've got to incorporate that with your original uh, vertex positions to create the actual um, final vertex position you want. That makes some degree of sense to me, but I'm not sure if that's coming across any. Hmm. 
maybe it'll be clear in time. Um, Farad, are all the vertices on the sphere surface? They are indeed, because um, the subdivision is going to... We're essentially interpolating across uh, the original vertex. Sorry, the original patch. Ah. So, yes, they're all on that plane. Um, the original, which I think you might have missed the very start of the stream, this was normalized. And then I'll scale it down so we can actually see what's going on. But there, we, when we add, you know, add extra levels of tessellation, we can get this lovely smooth sphere at very little cost. But it was the normalize that was fixing that. Otherwise, we're just interpolating across the plane. I see it at the bottom of the screen. Uh, ah, bottom of the screen. Yep. And Darius was saying, I think Baggers uh, just Googled for it. The inner triangles with the smaller stroke are tessellated. Yes. Oh, the, yeah, we're not working from papers today, Barrett. Basically, uh, the original idea was I was going to be doing terrain. And I had an idea of how to do it. And then in the few minutes before the stream, when I thought, aha, I, I, I'll sit down and have a quick read. I realized I was talking shit and I would have to come up with some other way. And then because it's been so long since I've done tessellation at all, I thought what we'll do this stream is basically just go through things. Go through the example code that I've got here. This example that is in um, Kepler examples repo. You can, if you Google for, to be honest, if you Google for GL tessellation, you're going to find this tutorial, which is by the Little Grasshopper. It's absolutely fantastic. And it's the one that, um, yeah, gives us what we've got over here. And so I basically, to implement the tessellation stages, I started with this code and used it as my test case and then just kept going until I made the compiler. Compile everything. Which was fiddly. And also, actually, one thing I didn't mention was in the Kettle examples repo, there's two tessellation examples. There's tessellation, which we're looking at right now, which is done in Lisp code, and there's tessellation inline GLSL. And here you can find the stages pretty much as they are in um, Grasshopper's tutorial, with a little, with a few simplifications, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, but this also demonstrates how to define uh, stages in, yeah, <laughs> with raw GLSL rather than using my compiler. So, with him out of the way, all my example code. There's probably going to be a few coffees required in this stream as well. Um, okay. So yeah, I think I get the idea of an abstract patch now. We're just going to be, if we say triangle, it's just going to be that perfect little right angle triangle. It's going to tessellate that, and then we're going to do whatever we like to interpolate it or otherwise apply it to our existing vertices. I think that makes sense. I think that's, I think that's right. Okay, so then it's talking about the levels. And it's, again, specifying the amount of tessellation that's going on. Um, there are four, there, there are a four vector of floats defining the outer tessellation levels and a two vector of floats defining the inner tessellation levels. That's really interesting. Um, I'm, see, I thought you're allowed patches with arbitrary number of uh, points. So I'm, I'm interested in why this is just a four vector and a two vector here, but that's fine for now. Not all abstract patches use the same number of values in the inner and outer tessellation levels. For examples, triangles only use one inner level and three outer levels. The rest are ignored. Okay, so... I guess we'll find out because, mm, nope, I'm still a little confused there. It's probably that when we, let's have a look again. The things that you can provide provide here 
I expect that this is limited to, to be at most quads. And so in that case, yeah, only like having four outer levels. So we do the first three outer levels here for our triangle. I guess if you use quads here, it's four. And I guess they don't provide anything other than quads after that. We'll check that out. And then the inner level, again, we've just got one level of inner tessellation. Uh, but for a cube, I can see you've got, sorry, for a cube, ha, for a quad, you would have two dimensions of uh, tessellation possible. So that's kind of interesting. And that's what we're going to get to eventually is tessellating. We might just, we might do that actually. We might make a lattice out of um, quads instead of triangles. Could be interesting. I mean, in the end, it's all going to get turned into triangles anyway. I think the geometry, does the geometry shader only work for triangles? I think that's it. Yes, I mean, you get to define... Oh, I don't know, actually. I'll have to get back to that one. I'm not going to dive into geometry documentation right now. The patch can be decided if, discarded if any outer tes tessellation level is zero or less, but only for tessellation levels that the abstract patch actually uses. Okay, so if we made a quad, and we didn't set that last one, it might be zero, and then that whole corner could be... That whole patch will be discarded. That's really interesting. Uh, the tessellation levels specified in this way are not directly used. They go through the clamping process to generate the effective tessellation levels. They use the primitive. Okay, the process depends on the tessellation evaluation stages. Spacing parameter. Ugh, equal spacing, fractional equal spacing, and odd spacing. Okay, that's just how the division is being done. Don't need to worry about that too much. Primitive generation order. Uh, when rendering without tessellation, the order of primitives relative to one another is well defined. Rendering techniques set up a vertex stream. Yeah, we, we, we set up the order. We say what it's going to be, and then we use cull face to decide. Is it cull face? I think it's cull face to decide whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise that we're going to use as our front face for a given triangle. Um, let's have a look here. Tessellation makes things less well-defined. While the order of vertices within a primitive is well-defined, the order of primitives generate the order of primitives generated relative to one another is not. Implementations define this ordering so you cannot rely on a particular ordering. Okay, so you can't rely on. Interesting. So you can rely on the order there, but not the order across triangles. I think that's what it's saying. Not too sure. The primitive specified at rendering time determines exactly how... Yes, we've done that already. Might need to come back to this one. That one's a little better. A little, little difficult. Tessellating primitives. Well, this is just talking about how things are going to be tessellated. So you can see there's an inner... Here's one inner value and three outer values that we specify. And so we're specifying how to subdivide these edges. And we get things like this. So if we set our inner tessellation to three, um, we should get something like this. In fact, let's try it. Oh, let's not go to that picture. Let's go and down here. I know we've already kind of screwed around with this stuff, but it is worth playing with it a few times to get the hang of it. So. The outside there is one, two, three, four. Outer level is four. Inner level is three. So that when we should be seeing something exactly like this. If we get one, two, three, four, one, two. Oh no, this is one, two. How did I count that? Oh yeah, sorry. I counted the vertices and not the parts. Let's have a look at that again. So one, two, three, and there's our inner triangle. Yes, that makes some degree of sense. An inner tessellation four, uh, outer tessellation has stayed the same. So let's do that. And again, we should see there's going to be an inner triangle, center point, inner triangle, same stuff either way. Oh yeah, outer's four now, isn't it? One, two, three, four. <laughs> Nice. Well, that's cool. That makes that makes sense. 
And so that's just saying, yeah, what kind of things, do you, and it's showing that you can set different levels at different sizes. And this will be, it'll work out the point positions and then the implementation has to work out all the triangles, um, the rest of the edges. So there's some specified stuff. You can't just chop off a bit of the triangle. No area of the triangle would cover more than one triangle, <laughs> like the little triangles. Um, some other details. And, oh yeah, there's always triangles between the different rings and rest of the edges are implementation defined, but they should also be implementation consistent. So, although we can't rely on them exactly, we should be able to rely on them matching up if we put them face to face, side to side. Should be fine. Quads, we've got four, wow, okay, so we got, no, ah, I see, yeah, two inner tessellations, yeah, those are the two dimensions, and then we have four outer tessellations, cool, that's it. So our primitives, our primitive options are actually isolines, quads, and triangles. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm still not entirely sure what this guy's for then. We'll have to look into that. But I think we should jump from here because this is, again, is all fine and dandy, but it's a lot of details that we don't really need to care about right now. Um, patch, interface, and continuity. This is going to be important, but I think my head's going to pop if I read this right now. So we'll skip that because I really want to get it into the control shader here. And finally, we get to the evaluation. <sighs> finally, we get to the evaluation shader down here. May as well talk about it quickly. It's, it's responsible for taking the abstract coordinates from our little ideal tessellated triangle and um, applying them to our actual values. Yeah, we, we use the original values to compute the actual values uh, for our vertices. So what you could do there is say if you'd had a big old plane, say a big old lattice, and then you subdivided a bunch of times, and then you had um, some kind of ocean wave simulation, this is the point where you would then displace all those new vertices based on the whatever the fluid simulation is telling you. And then you get really cool looking C, or at least the first part of it. And that's something I'd really love to do. That's going to be another stream for sure. Um, the tessellation evaluation stage is a mandatory part tessellation, yada yada. Um, it's rather like a vertex shader. Hooray, good. Then I understood that bit. Continuities for head exploding. That's a little bit later. Let's do the control stage. So there's going to be an introduction that tells us what it is. We're already aware of that bit. Um, its job is to feed uh, the tessellation levels to the primitive generation stage as well as to feed patch data as its output values to the tessellation evaluation uh, shader. Interesting. So I wonder, I want to look at what our stuff decompiled to. Number four, tessellation control stage. Here we go. Yeah, so unlike our vertex stage, where our first um, return type goes to GL position and the rest get passed on to the next stage, I think everything here gets passed on to the next stage. I'll have to make sure I document that properly. Um, because that's a little bit confusing otherwise. No, nope, let's have a look. V out of the invocation ID. Yes, you, ah, there's some details about this that we'll hit soon, but I think the control stage is only allowed to manipulate the vertex currently specified by the invocation ID. It's allowed to look at any of the others, but isn't allowed to modify any of them. And because there is no choice, um, R1 just doesn't let you do anything else. Cool, so yes. You have some output points, and they're gonna go to the next one. Cool, so this is just our way of taking, oh yeah, you can actually see it here. This sends the positions through to this stage, and they're up here. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're not used anywhere in that stage. All that's happening is they're being passed onto the evaluation 
uh, stage because we're going to interpolate across them when we've got our tessellated patches. Gotcha. Tessellated primitives. Terminology is really hard to get right when you're learning stuff. I know that's kind of the point, but yeah. Cool. Okay, so it's different from most other shaders. Oh, we've actually just seen that. Um, it is most similar to compute shaders. Unlike geometry shaders, which each invocation can output multiple primitives, each TCS invocation is, is responsible for own ha ah, is only responsible for producing a single vertex of output to the output patch. Cool. Free patch provided during rendering. Um, N TCS shader invocations will be processed. Where N is the number? Ooh, that's interesting. For each patch, sure, it's going to run this shader n times, where n is the number of vertices in the output patch. So if a drawing command draws 40 patches and each output has four vertices, cool, okay. Oh, well, that makes sense, actually. Yeah, you're gonna have to, you're gonna get evaluated once each time for that patch. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That's a, a little bit confusing because, yeah. So in a geometry shader, you get run once per patch, and then you can do all kinds of emitting geometry and stuff like this. So you get run once for each triangle. This time we're gonna get run once for each vertex in the triangle we're emitting or patch we're emitting, and we're allowed to do things to that one vertex. Ooh. Precise terminology is critical when doing stuff. Oh, then we're doomed! We're doomed! <laughs> oh, Shimera, don't say I'm a politician. That's just... That's what I'm inferring from that, and that's just upsetting. Far too hairy and stuff to be a politician. Well, I hope so anyway. That was my insurance policy. Okay, right. Let's have a look. Well, that's interesting. So when they're talking about the patch size, they're not talking about, why don't they say patch length? Or patch anything, like patch vertices. That's a good, good enough name. Why is it the size? That's annoying. Okay, so that part here is determining what they call the patch size. And we see that compiled to this. And it has to be constant. It determines the number of TCS invocation used to compute this patch data. The output patch size does not have to match the input patch size. So we can have triangles coming in and quads going out, for example. I think that's right. Okay, so all of the inputs from the vertex uh, shader. I don't know why it says shaders there, I'm not too sure. That confuses me. There's a few pieces in the in the spec that use that kind of terminology. I think it might be related to pipelines, but I'm not sure. Uh, aggregated into arrays based on the size of the input patch. Yeah, so our input patch is specified down here is three because it's triangles. And so up here we get position three. And I'm pretty sure, again, this is something that uh, Keppel is going to check for you. So I think if you do this, oh, it didn't didn't complain. That's worrying. Oh, that's because it's in the test test eval. Try this. Why didn't that complain? Oh, that's disappointing. That's something it really should be checking for you. Okay, so then it knows about the buffer stream, but it should have been checking those other things. That sounds like a feature I'm gonna have to add at some point. I'll do that, that's no problem. I wonder if there's any reason I'm not able to check that at compile time. I wouldn't have thought so. Okay, all input stages from, yeah, are in arrays. Every tessellation, uh, 
control shader, man, it's just going out of my head now, uh, for an input patch has access to the same data, except for that invocation ID. Oh yeah, that's what we read earlier, which will be different upon each invocation. So anything can look at basically the entire patch, which is good. Again, similar to the geometry stage, except the geometry stage is down to affect the entire patch in one go. The inputs may have interpolation qual uh, qualifiers on them. They have no function. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, so we have patch vertices in, primitive ID, and invocation ID. It's the number of vertices in the input patch. The index of the current patch within this rendering command. Okay, yep. And, oh, that's actually kind of cool. Yeah, and the invocation ID, which we already know. So because we're, ah, okay. So in this case, because we're setting our output size to be three, we can safely use it to index into this. We could justifiably set this to four, in which case it would be wrong to index into it. Um, odds are though, that will just result in undefined behavior on the GLSL size. It probably wouldn't detect that. Uh, we, we can see actually, let's, if we do, oh yes, it's definitely gonna do that because it's basing this off this value and it doesn't know it. Cool. And I don't check, I don't, my compiler can't do that kind of uh, dependently typed array range checking kind of stuff. Whew. Anyway, all that stuff comes in. And then we have to specify a load of stuff coming out. So the stuff coming out is passed directly to the valuation shader. Yes, okay, so that was the point here. This guy is going straight to here rather than going into that middle stage at all. It's kind of kind of confusing again because it's just not immediately a visual. So we have control, evaluation. What was that other stage called? I can't remember, but this guy in the middle. So the values from here are going straight over to here. We've got stuff coming in. We've got some, the uh, inner and outer values that we specify here are going into this in an output, which now looks like IO, which is not what I meant to say. And then we've got these declarations here, which are kind of feeding back into this as well. And then we've got this. That's kind of ugly. I mean, it's really tempting to have this exist in this stage, but because this stage is optional, we can't really do that. Because then it were, Keppel would say that, oh, rules are different in Keppel. You need to have one of these stages all the time as this. And there's probably some good reasons to avoid that some days. Okay, all right. Stepping on, nine o'clock. Coffee's still, it's gonna be cold now, but. go for a top up in a minute here we go here's that detail a tessellation control shader can only ever write to the per vertex output variable that cons uh, corresponds to the invocation so it's completely illegal to write to anything other than this right so if the, that's the only thing you're ever allowed to write to why do you allow people to write to anything else and that was the logic that meant that um whatever you return from here is going to be yes turned into where is it come on chris yeah we have a v out here and you'll see that whatever you return which was this value here is being written straight into that gl invocation id and you can't get it wrong that way that's cool that makes sense then per patch output variables are not aggregated into arrays unless you want them to be, in which case you must specify a size. Ooh. Per patch output variables. Okay, right. So, pardon me. Um, I don't know what my syntax is for per patch stuff. That's kind of interesting.
It seems kind of weird for me to let left that out though, so. Let me go for a quick grab and see what we can find. Um Interesting. Dun 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 dun. Nope. Nope, that's admitting certain kinds of patches. Output patch, that's the metadata that we specify at the top of the tessellation stage. Hmm. I guess not. Do I have any notes in here for... Um... Oh, bloody hell. There's plenty of notes. Ah, fuck it. I can look that up another time. <laughs> There's en enough of this stream is just me staring at things anyway, so... Let's keep moving for the sake of sanity. Um, actually, since it's one hour, I'm going to top up my coffee, and then I'll be right back with you. So, one second, folks. And one of these buttons. Much better, okay. Let's see what's going on on the chat side. Hey there, Zymus, Uncle Bugsy. Welcome to the stream. Not sure if, I've seen you guys around here before. Normally it's less of me just reading things and more coding, but this week is uh, time for me to learn tessellation shaders again. Okay. 
So per patch data, there probably is a way to do it, but I can't remember what it is. Um, Built-in outputs. Okay, so these are the tessellation levels that are uh, built in. That's fine. They're per patch as well. Ah, here we go. This is this is interesting. So, if, okay, so the first bit: if any of the outer levels used by the abstract patch type is uh, zero or negative, then the patch will be discarded. That's important. Um, this is per patch data, which is why we only write it once. As with any other patch variable, multiple TCS invocations for the same patch can write to the same tessellation variable, so long as they are all computing and writing the exact same value. So... So yeah, just had to be completely deterministic, and I suppose just having one of them write uh, rather than all of them simplifies that at the cost of a if. That's fine. This is some details, but let's say generally of no practical value. It's modifying vertices there. You're going to be doing this with the tessellated stuff anyway, so why bother? Um, and then we get into synchronization. Whew, okay. This is already mentioning barriers, which means I'm not going to worry about that for now. It's going to be more than we need. Um, there is a maximum output patch size. That is the max patch vertices. Let's see what it is for my machine. It's kind of interesting. GL get. Oops. 32. Okay, fair enough. Um, the minimum required limit is 32, so we're on the minimum. That would be kind of crazy to have that many vertices anyway. Max patch vertices? That's interesting. There are other implementations on output size, however. The number of components for active per... Wow. Okay, right. So the number... This gets fiddly. But what it's talking about is hey, you can pass values from this stage onto following stages. Uh, if it's a float, it's one component. If it's a vector four, I think that's one component. No, oh, this is like, no, it's that's four components. I get confused here between components and positions where the position of a vertex, yeah. A, a vector four takes up one position and so does a float. It gets details. That's interesting. So basically, there is a limit to these as well, so be careful. Um, and this will be interesting as well. Um, per patch output variables, and there's a limit on the total number of components that can go into an output patch in general. Whew. Yeah, so it's still actually quite a lot of data. We're not going to worry about that. So, cool. Long story short. Any of the... Like, this is going to get called once for each value that's... Sorry, for each... Yes. <laughs> Fuck. Nearly had it. Okay. This is this shader is going to get called once per output vertex. So it's going to get called three times for these three output vertices. Um, any one of these or all of them can write to these per patch values. But if they do, they better all be the same. Otherwise, things are going to fuck up. 
So we ch we uh, just pussy out and just say, hey, we're going to only do it if the invocation ID is zero. So we're only going to write them for one of the invocations. That's fine. And that's it. The only thing of value is really writing those values. So that's cool. And then finally, fucking hell, then we're going to go through that stage. We're just going to tessellate loads of things based on some stuff. And we're going to get into tessellation evaluation. Good grief. This is what's so tricky with this. It takes it took me ages the first time around to get all this stuff into my head. Enough to do the compiler. I'm hoping it won't take as much this time just to get something useful going. We'll see though. <laughs> my compiler can't sounds like an internal PR. <laughs> yeah. like the tessellation render had a bunch of stub roots. Oh, sorry for the maps. Cool. Sorry, man. I was getting, getting confused with what you were saying there. Um, I won't repeat it for the for the stream because it wasn't pertaining to this. Talking about travel. Okay, so evaluation shader. Nice. Takes the results of the tessellation operation and computes the interpolated positions and other perverted data from them. That's fine. Um, we get the abstract patch, which we've seen already. That was that little right angle triangle where everything was just tessellated. Um, the number of times test is invoked can differ from implementation to implementation. This is very important. Like, and this is the same as true of your verdict stage. Sometimes it's required to run a verdict stage more than once for the same vertex. Um, this is one of the reasons you want to have things be fairly deterministic. Because otherwise you can get some weird results. It's well specified where you have to be careful. Uh, but these things matter. As with a lot of details that come out of the fact that this is a big old parallel monster of a machine that we're programming. Um, that's cool. Here we go. Actually, it specifies here. Um, there is no guarantee that the test won't be invoked multiple times for the same vertex however like the test the vertex shader the test is expected to output the same value for the same vertex in the abstract patch make sure you're consistent don't throw your randomness there uh, they can be expanded an arbitrary number of times at any point in time so if you do side effects <laughs> yeah yes as shimera says don't fuck around heed the man cool right bloody hell Okay, so what else have we got in here? So there's some options. Cool, yes, this is nice. Um, so we have said here what kind of primitive we're going to be outputting. And because we've said triangles here, this middle stage that we can't see, the fixed function part of our pipeline, is giving us... Um, an abstract triangle rather than an abstract quad or anything like this. So that is important. And then we have some things and see, we can only get isolines, triangles and quads. And then quads are gonna, yeah, be turned into triangles as well. Um, we must provide this option and we do. Must provide this option. Oh, better make sure then if I take this out that something fucks up because there we go. Oh, ah, oh, that's annoying. My compiler should have complained about that, not left it to the other compiler to complain about. That's just lazy compilerness. We have a compiler. Don't let other people's compilers do that work. We could have given a friendlier message. Nice. Anyway, so that'll be something to something to fix. Um, Jace, I mean, what if I want to cache something computed in a macro, though? Um, on the off chance you're not joking on that point. Um, I mean, you're not able to write out of most... Um, well, until recently, let's say. You weren't 
able to write values out of stages per se. Mutation was harder. Most of the thing is going down the pipeline. Um, that is different these days. So let's see. Um, there's There are kinds of buffers that you can bind, SSBO buffers, uh, where you can write into them. A lot of the a lot of these features are provided under the kind of trust that you know what you're doing with um, your rendering pipeline and how you're using memory because it will not protect you. You have to be careful with atomics and with fences and with all this stuff to make sure. Um, yeah, but I think you were joking. But the, on the off chance someone's watching, but didn't know that. There you go. Wonder whether tessellation is actually useful for for. Uh, Wonder whether tessellation is actually useful for calculating great suckeries. I don't really know, mate. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Oh yeah, load storage, cool. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, there's some really cool stuff. I can't wait to start digging into that. There's some really interesting patterns. Um, oh, CL macros go to town, man. You can do whatever you like there. I mean, the um, the shader compiler supports all kinds of macros as well so you, you're free to use whatever you like in there um, and we have some extras as well because we're able to propagate values you're, you're yeah i'll get i'll get get to that one another day i should actually do a thing on that of the extras of the vario compiler i can't remember if we covered some of this in in my vario video probably not well not too deeply in focus chris god damn right spacing um there will always be an even number of segments or there will always be an odd number of segments equal distances between vertices and the object patch okay so it's just yeah how these things are spaced out i don't know when i want the other thing i want to equal most of the time it's confusing enough as it is primitive ordering when are missing triangles the winding order can be important for face culling The abstract patch has no idea what's going on. So it's the responsibility of this stage to take abstract patch coordinates and generate real clip space or whatever uh, your geometry shader expects positions from them. Hmm. So, yeah, because it's our responsibility to do all these things, we can specify which order we want to have things provided to us, I think. Remember that this parameter only controls the winding order of triangles within the abstract patch. The winding order of the final triangle primitives will ultimately be based on the tessellation evaluation shaders generated positions. As such, different triangles generated from the same patch can have different winding orders. Ooh. And it's optional. And it will use... Um, Counterclockwise by default. Fair enough. This one I'm still a little hazy on, but we'll get to it. It's fine. Oh, yes. I, I know why. Because when we get down to this stage... No. I thought we were using a mitt here, but we're not. Oh yes, of course. Okay, so we're doing our model to clip matrix here because we don't do it on these values. And these are the ones that get passed to here. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. Cool. Groovy. Okay, so primitive generation. Normally the kind of primitive admitted from the primitive generator is defined by the abstract patch type. ISO lines will be generated series of ISO lines, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can force the primitive generator to override this and simply generate a point primitive for each vertex in a desolated patch um, yeah and your ordering doesn't matter at that point that's kind of weird but yeah i suppose there is value to that somewhere especially if you're throwing a geometry shader after this and doing so oh there it actually says that right there chris god damn read the thing okay so there's some inputs and just as with the other outputs, they're going to be arrayed uh, by the size indexed by the vertex index. 
Um, they're declared without an explicit size. Yes, that's interesting. Do I get that right in my compiler? It's kind of nerve-wracking, actually. Where's our... It's our geometry stage. Oh, we size R's to GL match pa max patch vertices. That's interesting. I guess I read somewhere that, that was okay. Um... Yeah. Oh, can be declared without an explicit size. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and I just set it to max otherwise. Cool. Have the following built-in inputs. Yep. So yes, this is the main one we've been uh, fucking around with. Tessellation core, the location within the abstract patch of this particular vertex. So... We have some geometry defined, like some triangle that looks like this, but the tessellation stage is going to give us this abstract patch, this is a perfect little triangle, and then we need to take these values that are interpolated across here and apply them to our um, bar. Now, we're going to be provided this and we're going to apply it. <laughs> oh, fuck it. Doodles aren't going to work. Anyway, we need to take some values and apply them to things. I can't think and draw at the same time, apparently. Oh, that's funny. Right. Oh, boy. What are we getting into now? Right, um... Yeah, that artifact comes by every now and again, doesn't it? It's interesting. Shimera is doing... Sorry, it's not Shimera. Uh, Jace is doing some interesting stuff. Okay, so he's talking about caching um, code from macros. I've done a ton of a bit of this kind of fuckery myself. Playing with a CL def type with gensims a symbol and assigns to its symbol function and then caches the symbol. Ooh, that sounds weird. To use it in a satisfied predicate that compiled to later. That's, um, okay, so yeah, you're, um, <laughs> that's pretty hairy. The The thing that uh, kind of weirds me out a little by that one is just that means that every time you are recompiling that macro, you're defining a new type, correct? Or have I got that wrong? Because you're doing, um, are you defining the def type named by the gensim? Shreya is saying, don't put that much logic in the types. Yeah, I feel feel a little bit for that. I, I must admit the, um, just, just out of the, When it comes to like satisfied predicates and stuff like that, that, that always to be done at runtime anyway. So I guess it's just a matter of interest. I'm not too interested in checking all those things at runtime. Um, let's have a look. Jace was saying, I'm playing with building a new type system atop the existing one with much nicer static typing facilities and a code walker to generate the uh, simple proper D declarations. Oh, that's really cool. You and I need to talk about that because I have plans for something similar in the future, but using a slightly different mechanism. Um... I mean, essentially, like, you can, obviously, if you're making your own subset of a language, at that point, you're essentially, yeah, you're defining your own macro expander and you're defining that logic. It's just a, again, it's another DSL that lives within Lisp. And it might look very similar to Common Lisp, but, a, yeah, different. But I I'm, I'm, I feel you for that. No, the def type is expanding into a generated satisfies predicate. Okay, that's interesting. How is that working for static typing, though? Because, um... Yeah, like Shimera says, the compiler will immediately give up when it seems satisfies. 
Or are you doing your own type checking as well? See, I just wouldn't do that with def type. I would just store my own, like, implement your own type checker and then run that in macro expand time. But that is very interesting. But yeah, I would love to talk with, uh, to you about that off stream because, say, I, I want to do some static type checking stuff in Common Lisp at some point. And uh, I have a few little bits of hackery that are ready for that. <laughs> CLS type system is pretty garbage. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I'm doing my own type checker, but I want the types to work with things like type B. Oh, okay, right. So, <laughs> so you omit the satisfies predicate, so when people use type P, it'll use that. Oh, that's interesting. And that's, have you found that reliable on the implementations you've tested? Because that's interesting. I haven't checked the uh, standard, actually, to see what it says about. Uh, whenever it gets down to kind of, um, oh, what is it? Like subtype P and some of that stuff type uh, is it type p or type of it starts getting a bit kind of hairy because of how expressive the system is and i've just like oh i'm backing off from here <laughs> garbo was quite pretty good old great garbo oh man do you have, uh phil fogg have you listened to the um oh this is something barrett's definitely seen the uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore going on about um, when they're down the pub and getting assaulted by various uh, supermodels of the day. Oh, that was so good. Anyway. Satisfies, I believe, is guaranteed to work with type P. Interesting. <laughs> Chimera, there's a few uh, ELS talks about LCL's type system, how shit it is. I don't think that was quite the, <laughs> the thesis of their talks they were trying to encode a bunch of stuff and it was a pain in the ass but they 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 were quite i don't know they were quite fans of the language and <laughs> most of the time but yeah it's uh it's a pain in the ass derek and clive thank you barrett god damn though that was funny that is one of the oh, I, I i'll end up on a comedy rant that stuff's amazing okay um, yeah, the compiler is free to ignore any declarations it can't deal with. You don't know that one. Oh, man. It's, uh, show <laughs> showing me, oh, sh showing, uh, Barrett's age and showing how out of touch with modern culture I am, I think is, uh, what it really does. A lot of the comedy references I'll be making are from kind of 40s to <laughs> 60s. Um, but anyway, you're referencing Greta Garbo, so... You're probably in the same boat. Okay. Oh, Shin, I'm not arguing with you with the type system stuff. It's just... Uh, I, I, I always love your pitching of <laughs> of different things. It's it's so to the point. Um, Barrard, do you know the crazy... HXRE Lord High Chamberlain censorship? I don't think I do, mate. But I didn't entirely pass that sentence. So anyway, I should actually finish reading this documentation before the end of the stream. I think next week we'll um, next week we might have a go actually doing something with tessellation. Anyway, there's some stuff that comes in. This being the most important. Um, some of the other values we're already interested in: primitive IDs. The index of the current patch in the series of patches being processed is the primitive ID. Oh yeah, the other things. I confused myself for a second because I thought that was related to instance ID. I'm wrong. That's all right. I thought there was some clashing there. Yeah, let's ignore this bit. It's nothing too dramatic. We've got some stuff coming in. No biggie. GL position. Pervertix information. Interesting. So each tessellation invocation output um, outputs a separate vector worth of data. Therefore, the tessellation evaluation stage outputs are scalars. Separate vertex worth of data. Okay, so this is once for each vertex. 
You can have output arrays, but they won't be treated specially the way per vertex input arrays are. Yeah. I have to see how my compiler handles per vertex output arrays in tessellation evaluation. That sounds like a that sounds like a combination that I really haven't tested. Okay, user defined outputs from the tessellation evaluation stage ha can have interpolation qualifiers on them, but they won't. At least not in my stuff. Not for now. Per vertex defines an interface blocks for outputs. You don't have to worry about interface blocks in um, in Vario. I try and deal with that stuff for you. It's a pain in the ass how um, GLSL handles the interface between different shader stages. It really, really gets on my nerves. Makes it surprisingly difficult to ah oh, just make a consistent interface that works across those stages. And it's still, I mean, I've still got problems with it. I, I will have to. Go back and improve at some point, but oh man, I'll go off on a rant on that one anyway. Yeah, the variables only take on meaning of the shader is the very last active vertex processing stage. So these ones. Which it's not, because we're going to have geometry shader after this. Blimey. Okay, so. At least should be able to understand this tiny bit of code now. Which is, yes, these are the positions of the original triangle that we passed in. Let's get the doodle thing back out again. These are the positions of the original triangle that were passed in here. And they went via here, down to here, which didn't do anything with them, but passed them along here, and then down into here. And then this is the per abstract um, patch information that we apply onto this with multiply and we get our final um, 3d position and we transform it with the model to clip matrix to make sure it's in the right space and we shove it out send it on its way to the next one into the geometry stage Oof, what a journey So for our map stuff, I actually want to do quads. That would be ideal. Um, I suppose the first thing we can do, let's just, I just want to turn this into a different shape to start with. Seems we're not going to get much done today, but that is as much of the documentation as I think we need to go through to be actually able to do useful stuff. The main tripping point, and I guess the thing that's actually never been quite right in my head, even up till right now, is the concept of the abstract patch. I kind of glossed over it because I get confused each time I'm reading it, but it, that is the fundamental principle behind this, is that you've got two different patches that are brought together by this. And that's really interesting. And it's obviously the, the abstract patch that's tessellated. Peter, Peter. Anyway. <laughs> and Barrett wasn't around when that came out. <laughs> Jay, oh, Shimera is saying, Jason, I want to talk to Bike, um, who's one of the chaps uh, working on... Isn't he working on Sickle with, um, with those folks? Because I think he gave a talk at ELS, didn't he? Smart dude. Oh yeah, it says Cleaver and Clasp. Uh, okay, yeah, he's working on Cleaver and that's being used in Clasp. Nice. Sorry. Thanks, Shen. Sorry, I should actually read the whole... Ah, I shouldn't read the whole chat stream. Otherwise, you'll have to just watch me staring at you for ages before I actually say anything. There's enough of that in the stream already. Okay, so we have 20 minutes left. God, you folks are good for hanging around for this as I just read things. This is the kind of stuff that I was really nervous about doing these kind of streams where it was actually just me learning from scratch because, or nearly from scratch, because it is kind of, hey, there's not much going on. 
Yeah, the fucking recordings of ELS were really disappointing. You go to a proper fucking conference and you would expect that <laughs> I say that as I fuzz in and out of focus. They need to learn something about recording. Uh, no, anyway, but yeah, it was it was kind of shitty. Um, Though the year before they did a much better job, and that was just um, Matey Boy sorting out for uh, the guy who um, organised it at the uni. That was really good. I don't know, man. I'm tempted to see if I can borrow some of the recording equipment from Fuse next year and uh, bring that with and set up an alternate um, filming for the events. Because I really want to go back and watch, especially what was the, um, the dude who was talking about uh, macro expansion. That was a fantastic talk. Year before it was done by people who gave a shit. Yeah, no, I agree. There are a few things in that um, conference that were just a bit disappointing, like the building works happening right outside the damn, <laughs> the damn uh, lecture hall. Rage rant shout at the sky. Yeah, come on, Barrett, you should come down to ECS and do some recording for us. That'd be excellent. Unless you do a bad job, then you could never return. Um, cool. Right, let's fuck around with some basics in this. Where are we setting up the stream? What's this brick thing, anyway? We're loading a texture and we're doing nothing with it. Oh, smart. Smart, smart, smart. Okay. Okay, so I would like to change this up and rather than have a... Um, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'll do a lattice made of triangles and then we're going to switch to quads if we get time. So up here, let's do lattice, which is still spelled incorrectly if I remember, if I remember right, lattice data. Actually, what do we have here? Sphere data, yeah, no, it's lattice data. It's going to have a width of 5 and a height of 5 and it's going to have a number of X segments. Actually, let's just do 4 and Y segments for that's enough to prove a point. And it doesn't have lines of longitude or latitude, so let's remove those. Recompile this and say in it again. And now we will go and take out that rotation. And then the rotation here is identity. There we go. Let's remove that line. Let's go and find our camera position again and put it zero. That's rather worrying already. <laughs> Seeing there's something that just doesn't look right. What is going on in that last row? What? What? Ah. <sighs> Oh, that's going on in the last row. That's rather interesting. That's the damnedest thing. What the fuck, man? <laughs> it's like something's uh, dropping a load of the triangles. Why would it be doing that? I'm just going to go and do some major surgery for a second. Oh, I don't need to do this. We can just take it out here. Huh. Something to do with the tessellation. I bet that's related to that artifact we're seeing on the sphere as well.
that makes sense. Um, so, what have I got wrong? Make sure that we don't have anything I don't expect in here. Nope, just the tessellation and the fragment stuff. Interesting. <laughs> People who live in blurry houses. Good point, sir. The tessellation evaluation shade stage maps from points in the abstract patch in abstract space to the actual primitive in clip space using the points in the input patch. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> well, the test maps from points in the primitives in the abstract patch to points in the generated primitive using the points in the input patch. <laughs> Yeah, see, like it's a difficult sentence to mash together, or at least it is for me. Getting links about hobbits. I have a kinship with them due to hairy feet. Um, trying to summarize as best I can. No, it's good, man. Keep going. <laughs> it's, a, it's a noble effort. I suppose the first thing is what happens if we do this? Oh yeah, because patch through. Oh, that's actually kind of informative. We take this out. What the shit is going on? Is there just a bug in my lattice code? It really looks like there is. That's embarrassing. Oh, that is not okay. Has that really been there the whole time? Oh, man. Okay, so there's some new bugs to file. Jace, save me! Could you just put a, a, an issue on uh, Nineveh saying that the lattice might be adding an extra quad at the bottom or and or it's missing a row? That is some stupid stuff right there. Ah, oh, okay, fine. We'll, um... Let's do this a different way, then. One quad. <laughs> At least he got that right. Um... Let's, uh... Restore all the other bits of this. Oh yeah, where's um Ah oh, set off position of the camera back to there. Okay, then we'll go back to here. Here's our inner and outer levels. Okay. No tessellation. Two on the outer tessellation, three on the outer tessellation, four on the outer tessellation, nine on the outer tessellation. Then start adding inner tessellation. There's nothing it can do with two. The minimum things it can do is when it has three to form an inner triangle. We go to five and nine. We can see these rings build up. This is exactly the kind of thing we're going for. Um, except we're going to base it on quads because rather than this kind of zigzag stuff that we're getting here, I want rows. And I want to see if it will do that properly. Um, so the first thing we can do is we will go and make a GPU array. So we'll, we'll fuck all of this. So say make GPU array. How much time we got left? 10 minutes. Let's see if we can get anything working. This might be hairy. So I'm not worried if it doesn't work. Um, so we're going to go from, what is it? Minus one, one, zero to 
minus one, minus one, zero. I think that's that's probably correct. Um, to one, minus one, zero. To one, one, zero. Yeah, that, that should be that should be something vaguely sensible. Then the element types are vector three. The well, there's nothing else we need to do there. We're not going to have an index array, so we can just make this a let. And I can get rid of this terrible thing. God, I can't believe this problem with lattice. That's so stupid. When did that? When did that break? I've been using those. Anyway, don't think about that. Think about this. We're going to make a buffer stream. We're going to take this GPU array that we already made. It's there. We're not going to have an index array on it. What other things can we specify? Primitive, yes. This is going to be important. We need to set it to be a patch of four. And we say init and things are going to go wrong. Okay, so we're passing in. The buffer stream passed to draw sphere um, contains patches of four. And uh, draw sphere was expecting patches. Ah, that should say that better. That's another bug. Actually, um, it got it right down here though. Look, it's a, It's also worth noting that uh, it is impossible to pass triangles to a pipeline declared to take patch. Oh, sorry, it's possible to pass triangles to de pipeline declared to patch three. To pass lines to declare to patch two. Okay, so this was just extra information. It should up here realize that it's being asked to take a patch of three. Um, whoops. Let's go up to def pipeline and we're going to say patch of four. And then we're going to say continue. And then it's going to complain about the fact that our stages now have some interesting things about them. So, but the output arguments from one stage are not compatible with the inner arguments of the next. The output stage coming from a vertex, um, which is an array of four vector threes. So this is implicit. This is one of the things that Keppel worked out was because um, our pipeline takes patch four, patch four has to be what's coming out of here. And then it's come down to here and this is taking an array of three vector threes and that's not correct. We're going to be taking four. Um, yes, and that's what we need to change there. We're going to recompile this. We also need to go and modify our pipeline because it is expecting, well, we've told it to use this overload of that function. So we'll change that. Then this data is going to be passed onwards. That means this is going to be four. That's important. Let's move this uniform down. Um, we're going to have to fix this up. We might even be able to say OK now and get something to work. Nope. OK, it's stuff coming out of the control stage and going into the next stage, eval. So that will be because I need to update this to take four as well. OK, so Keppel is doing some checking for us. The error messages could do with some work. OK, and now we're seeing a triangle, which is wrong, but it's progress. So we need to change this to quads. Primitive of type quads came from the tessellation evaluation stage. Unfortunately, we weren't sure how to convert this to a primitive kind the geometry shader can use. Interesting. Ooh, that's kind of interesting actually. Now what can we declare for I mean, we're going to be getting, I thought the geometry shader is going to be getting triangles because that's what quads get turned into. This could be a bug. That might be what we're about to find out is that I've got another bug in my compiler. And that's again, believable. Um, let's have a quick look at the geometry shader in the last few minutes and just see what 
could be tripping us up here. It might be that as well as outputs, you can define inputs, in which case this will make a lot of sense. Um, input, 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 geometry shader. There we go. Now, input primitive. Okay, yes. It can only take these. Ah, wait a second. Here we go. Um, tessellation evaluation stage parameter. Okay, let's have a look. The input primitive must match the primitive type for the vertex stream provided to the geometry shader. If tessellation is enabled, then the primitive type is specified by the tessellation evaluation shader's output qualifiers. If input is not if tessellation is not enabled, then the primitive type is provided by the drawing command. Interesting. Okay, so this should be right. We we use GL triangles. We might just have to declare it. Oh. Assertion, oh dear. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we're running into a bug here and we're running out of time on the stream. So this is something for me to do before next week's stream. Stop fixing that goddamn compiler. Right, let's have a look. Output primitive. Um, see if there's anything obvious that I can find in def metadata kind. No. So I think what it is, is that um, I need to fix the compiler to correctly infer the correct type or add the declaration so you can tell it yourself. But that's fine. That can wait for another, uh, that can wait for another stream. Let's see what's going on over here. Already made it. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> See, Jace, Jace is now expanding on his description of what's going on. I'll read this quickly. The uh, TCS decides how the abstract patch gets generated and makes the abstract patch from the verts coming in from the vertex shader. Primitive generation makes the abstract patch as a bunch of primitives in normalized barycentric chords. TES maps points from points in the normalized barycentric coordinate space into points in world space using the points on the output patch. Fine. The problem is you've essentially rewritten the... <laughs> the GL documentation and that's that's what's difficult I mean actually that is that is a good little summary I think that's a little off though that's more likely to be in clip space rather than world space um, the output from that is believed to be in clip space just as it would be out from a vertex stage Whew. Apparently I'm a Lisp or Emacs magician. Nope. Uh, I just have fun toys that help me move around quickly. And so I look like I know what I'm doing. I don't. And I don't think I look like I do too. Right. And with more of Barrard's uh, terrible jokes, I think we wrap it up for the day. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, sorry it wasn't the terrain that I slightly promised on the Reddit thing. Um... But such is life. We, uh, I've learned some stuff at least, and I found some potential bugs in the compiler that I'm going to go and fix before the next stream. So what we'll do then is start looking into actually making our quads, tessellating them, and seeing if we can come up with some scheme for finding where we are on the um, lattice that we're going to be drawing. And I'll have to fix lattice code for next week as well, in case that's buggy. And, oh yes! That reminds me, good call, Shimera. Uh, Shimera is streaming on Sundays now, so get um, 
Uh, subscribe to that stuff. Words. Whatever you humans do when you watch things. Um, Tim Aaron's saying, hope you put there next Sunday. <laughs> Make even more negative process and clip maps. Yeah, unfortunately, I missed last Sunday's stream because I only got I only got the tweet that it was turning into a regular thing on um, Monday. But I will be there, hopefully. Yeah. I can't think of any reason I wouldn't be there Sunday. Um, my mate's over this weekend from England. But he's heading off before midday in on Sunday. So, yeah, I think I'm free. I should be down there. That'd be cool. Oh, thanks, Barrett. That was fun. Um... <laughs> trial could be inherently broken i must admit I'm, i've got to actually read your um is it the flow library you use for the graph optimization stuff i i really want to look into that code that's uh that's gonna be fun for another project for one day <laughs> oh yeah shimera's gonna be streaming at 8 utc Oh, you see plus two. Okay, so it's the same time as this, but on Sunday. Sweet. So it's, uh, what was it, 8 p.m. Central Eastern, Central European Standard Time. There we go. Ha, ah, words. Cool. Yes. Flow is the general graph library you wrote. Nice. Good night, everyone. See you, Phil. See you all. Thanks so much for hanging out. Catch you next time. Bye.